If you've got a question, the voices of resin are here. Ooh, Flash Chicks. Flash Chicks is an SPE sponsored podcast. Hi. Hey, how are you? You know, it's almost Thanksgiving. I'm ignoring my responsibilities and getting ready to just vomit Christmas all over this house. You know, I personally, uh, I'm as well, but I have been get, realized I've been going through some Lindsay withdrawals since we got to see each other so much over the past few weeks. We've had a lot of one-on-one time and it felt real nice. And now it's like, it's it's kind of upsetting. I kind of forgot you lived in a different part of the country. Very rude. Yeah, I kind of forgot that you were even in my phone. I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, been, I've been so busy with family. I'm, I'm sorry I haven't texted, you know. No. Okay. It's okay. I have hurt feelings, but we'll take them out on each other passive aggressively in this podcast. Yeah. So it's just like, it's like a, it's like a, a preamble for, yes. um, for, for the holidays. If you sense the undertones, you've picked up on it. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> um, I'm Mercedes Landazri. And I'm Lindsay Neville. And with our powers combined, we are Plastics, Plastics. the voices of resin. It's us. We're here. Uh, Yeah. So um, you can listen to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, The first Friday of every month, they're released by uh, SPE and um, published later to uh, SPE's YouTube page, which is for SPE. And Mm -hmm. um, what else? That is all the things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like you usually say that part. I'm like, um, and this and that. It's okay, stepping on my toes. I'll, I'll do a great notice start. that. <laughs> I swear I have not had it, I have not opened that wild turkey yet. We are recording um the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So um yeah. that's yeah, I don't usually given that I have to go pick up a tree. I also have not cracked into wild turkey or bottle of wine. That is yeah. <laughs> Within eyes view. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have a, a special guest with us today. Um, so we'd like to uh, bring her in before we continue talking about our uh, holiday problems. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to introduce Latia Watson, Vice President of Human Resources for Dekunik North America. Latia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about being here today. Yes. Um, we, so... For those that weren't cool enough to go to the Women Breaking the Mold conference um, that Plastics News puts on every year, we were we were there, Latia was there, and we saw you on a panel and we were like, we did the like twin energy. We're not, yeah. we're not technically <laughs> twins in case you didn't know, um, but we, we did the, the like, you're clocking this, and we were immediately like, how do we find her? without being super aggressive to go see if she'd be interested in being on the podcast it was so I was yeah I was medium aggressive and I said Mm -hmm. "Uh, hi uh saw you on stage I have a podcast will you will you be on it yeah (laughs) and I'm like yeah I'm here for it (laughs) it's the energy we like yeah um so you know you had kind of getting into some of your background, you know, you got your bachelor's at Indiana Wesleyan, which a large number of people from my high school went to too. So I'm actually like, I was like, oh, I haven't heard of that in a while. Um, Mm -hmm. You got your MBA at Miami University. You have multiple certificates from Cornell, George Washington University. Um, Was this reactive to changes happening in your career or the workforce? Like what prompted all this like insane amount of like knowledge and studied education (laughs) so I think um for me I've always been curious uh about business and I think that that uh, was stimulated a bit more when I made my career change from the automotive industry into the aerospace industry um in the aerospace industry I was doing a lot of um inside sales support and operational support um and working with customers because that was my job I was doing uh customers and contracts and as we were you know as you're building a business um it may take you two to three years to kind of get to where you're closing on a deal. And one of the parts of our process is that once we won the work, it already, you know, our bid indicated we need this many people by this time, you know, in these roles uh, in order to uh, successfully pull this off. 
and HR at that time was really challenged to respond um, and move as quickly as we needed. Um, and so I was like, I'm fixing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why this is so hard. Um, and the I think the other thing, having worked in the automotive industry, having worked in logistics and supply chain and working in distribution, and then in aerospace, I started to see that there were some trends um, about companies that performed very well and then companies that didn't necessarily perform well. And um, whether it was me working with dealerships or um, vendors, or it was me working, you know, as a uh, vendor, a tier one to, uh, I'm sorry, a, a tier one to a customer. Um, what I found is that the organizations that were really leveraging their talent did a lot well, where they had the right people in the right seats at the right time. They did very well. I also saw within my own organization that there was what I would call hidden talent. There were people within the business that were like, they were my go-to people, but they weren't on the organization's radar at all. And so um, as we would run into these issues, I started to kind of like doing the work of HR in, in my mind at that time and saying, hey, you know, Amy is really good at X. I think you should move her into this planning role or so-and-so is really good at Y. I think he would really be good on this um, new product introduction team. So-and-so is really good at this. I think this person would be really good for our, you know, um, customer quality role. And I started kind of informally doing that. And I went back to school because one, credibility. I, I, um, my degree wasn't in that. So I needed credibility to, I really do believe in having a good foundation for anything that I'm about to go and do. So I want it to be technically sound, you know, have that foundation and put that with my years of experience. And I felt combining those would, would help with that again, credibility. And then I think glass is just like a personal investment in myself. Um, I, I think too often we don't count the cost. Like we think we want to do something and we're looking from afar and say, oh, that looks cool. But as you start to invest in it, you find out like, no, I really, I don't like this. Because when I first started going to school, I majored in accounting mm -hmm. and I got to my third year and thought, if I have to do this every day for the rest of my life, I will die. I will just <laughs> die. I cannot. You and know, so that's I a good check. <laughs> yeah. So I went over, but as I got into my programs with um, IWU, um, I'm like, no organizational development. Yeah, that's my thing. That's really something that I'm passionate about. And then as I, because I love business, because that's always been my, you know, true north. I love mm -hmm. business. I love successful, uh, seeing business thrive and doing turnarounds, because that's another thing that I enjoy, um, taking something that's bad and turning it into something that's very well performing. So I went and got the MBA to kind of close it up. Um, and then the the Cornell stuff and, and all of that, it just helped me because I knew at some point I'd be working with unions, I'd be doing investigations. And I really wanted to um, make sure that whatever got thrown at me, um, I could I could pull it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you talk about, uh, I mean, some of the things that you're saying are I, my, in my work, I, I do a lot of trend forecasting, and it seems like a lot of the things that you're saying, too, are like looking at the big picture and then seeing the future, you know, and thinking, OK, well, what am, what skills am I going to need for, you know, five to 10 years from now? Yeah, I, I think one of the one of the things that um, just as a female being in a in a in many industries, because I've worked in a few of them, <laughs> um, you're the only one sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it became very um, important to me. And one role that I was in, I had to work with a lot of engineers. And I remember when I was in the room, if I said something, it was like no one paid attention to anything that I said, mm -hmm. because I wasn't an engineer. Um, but I had observations that were critical to the discussion that were being completely overlooked. And I remember um, I went up to kind of the most gruff of the group after one meeting. And I said, I mean, is my, am I not talking loud enough? You know, like, do I, 
Do I need to draw on a mustache? Like, what do I need <laughs> to do? Because this is getting ridiculous. And he says, until you can read a print, don't talk to me. Wow. Hmm. And I thought, oh, is that it? So I went to a blueprint reading, you know, class. Like, that's <laughs> not going to be that hard. Because <laughs> to me, it's like, what? oh, is that the thing? Oh, right. that what gives you street cred in this space? Okay, I'll be right back. So I went out, I took the class, I learned how to read engineering drawings. Um, I worked with the estimator, you know, and he really helped me do a deeper dive into what capabilities we had versus um, not. And then the next meeting that we went to after that, and I had an observation that we were getting ready to bid on something that we didn't have the technical capability. And I remember saying, hey, guys, um, real quick, this is calling for because it was a heat treatment. This is mm -hmm. calling for a rapid quench. And we don't have a furnace that does rapid quench. And I remember everybody in the room was like, like what? <laughs> what? How do you know that? I'm like, it's right here on the drawing. Right. And <laughs> from that moment that. on, it was like, OK, Larry. And it's, <laughs> you know? so sometimes I guess the, the moral of that story is like for me, the way that I viewed education hasn't always been like, let me collect paper because the paper really is meaningless. It's like what credibility will help me bridge a gap of communication or knowledge or understanding with this group that I need to reach and that I need to provide a service for or who, that I need to support. And I think like, I always encourage people when they get offended, but I, like I could have gotten offended that they weren't listening to me, but I was more curious, curious as to like, am I not talking loud enough? Do I need to wear a different color? Like <laughs> what's happening here? Is it, is it purely that I'm a woman? And then when they told me like, no, this is the baseline for whether we respect what you have to say. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I can do that. Now let's carry on because we got. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And I loved how direct you were in, you know, approaching that. I mean, because that's something, you know, I think a lot of us have felt that in meetings before where it's like, why am I not being heard? Why? Am, but actually addressing the, the even if you, even if you are one of the engineers <laughs> and you get so much more out of, out of, out of really you know, I don't know if it's even overcoming that fear. I mean, for me, it would have been really scary to ask that, but you, yeah. the, the, the rewards you reap is the knowledge, right? Well, what, what's behind this? Why am I not being listened to? What a great, it, great story of a win. And now that yeah, is a I, really good I, one. <laughs> and I think it's like the curious, like for me, I, I don't necessarily get irritated. I, I'm always curious. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. don't, like for me, I've never, felt like I knew everything about anything, right? And so if you're in a room and let's say there are five of us, I'm like, there are five brains here. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to use the power of every brain sitting in that room? And that's where my, I, I'm not taking like personal offense to the, you know, the being that I am, but I want to know, I'm really curious, why wouldn't you want the brain power of everybody sitting in this room? Mm -hmm. and, and that was like, Oh, okay. Are, are you one of those unique people that really do, do think you know everything or is it something else? <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually it's something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually, you know, sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. No, I was going to say, yeah, it, it usually ends up being the, the something else because, you know, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got going through engineering school, because it wasn't the path I originally thought I was going to take. Um, you know, someone said to me that, cause I was like, I'm just I'm not a great engineer. But I like this stuff. And they're like, you don't have to be the best engineer. You just have to know where to find the information. It's just about solving the problem. And like, it doesn't have to be you that solves it. It just has to be you that gets the information to solve it. And like, I think it's that stay curious, stay wondering, figure it out. You don't have to be the smartest person. Because if that was the case, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, Latia, so you, you'd said something, you said, you know, having, being in a room and then there's, oh, these are five new brains. It reminds me of something that, that you'd said on the, on the panel, one of the topics at hand was diversity, um, the panel at Women Breaking the Mold. And you said something um, that I, that I just loved and, and wrote down um, when you really challenged the audience to consider diversity um, being beyond gender or melanin. Um, can you can you talk more about that and diversity of thought? 
Yeah, so I um I, I don't know why that over the years um I've gotten so irritated with the the very um I would say very limited view of diversity and that um it is limited to gender and ethnicity um or, or maybe um even age, right? Mm -hmm. Um because there are so many other ways that we exclude people, um, whether we realize that's what we're doing or not. And I think the biggest thing came to me when I was working as, as a recruiting manager and I was recruiting for, you know, various, you know, facilities across the state, um, Mexico and, and the UK. And I would put forth, you know, make sure I understood what they were looking for. And I'm putting forth talent that I know is like, look, I'm giving you like three or four really good ones. You could pick any one of these and I know they'll do well and they will pass on all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's happening here, right? And what I found is that one, they would have bias. Oh, they've never worked in our specific space before, right? Yeah. Well, you don't think that someone who's worked in medical devices with all of the regulations that they have there can add any value to our space? Like, seriously? Relax. Or, <laughs> right. Or they, um, they, they're, they're too young. They won't get it. They're still wet behind the ears. Well, I know some really brilliant, hardworking young people or they're too old, right? Or they've been in the military. Military people are just very difficult and they're, you know, nobody, like that's a that's a, 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 a bias or a, a narrative that you've told yourself or that the organization may have told itself, but what it does is it closes you off to some really brilliant people, right? Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times those people, cause I, you know, if they're brilliant, I like them. And so I'm like, we're going to be friends. This didn't work out, but Hey, let's stay in touch. Right. Because I just, I like brilliant people. And so I kind of collect them, but anyway, <laughs> so I would follow them and you would see their career. And they, most of these people that got passed on are either in C-suite roles. They are, you know, senior leaders in organizations um, and everywhere they've gone, they've had successes. And so for me, diversity is being able to accept that there are people, whatever their shape and form is, that can add value to your business as mm -hmm. long as you understand the value that you need and stop putting all of these other parameters that really have nothing to do with anything. They just really don't. Um, we hired somebody that would have technically, they're like, oh, the, the biggest thing that I would get, oh, there's no career runway for this person. And so I, I started challenging that, right? Because again, that's a, people don't talk about that, but who are you to just say when this person should right. stop working, right? Yeah. But you have this person, this person, well, they only have five years left to work. Well, let's talk about it. On average, how long are people staying with companies anymore? Three to three to seven years. If they stay seven years, you got a winner, winner, chicken dinner. But most of the time, they're staying three to five years and then they're looking for something else, right? So do you want five years of someone that's like, I'm going to spend my last five years here and all this experience that I've gained over the last 30 years of my career, you get to be the beneficiary of it? At that point, they're in a knowledge transfer phase. So they're giving right. you everything they got because they want to leave a legacy. You're going to pass that up just because this person has got gray hair. Like, let's not be so. So it's a bit of a thing for me. And, and like women, I remember that we hired the first welder and this goes even to the skilled trades. The first welder that we hired that was a female. I, I, it, I don't know why that, that was so hard. But this young lady, she showed up at one of our open houses and she had welded a rose. Young, it was like a very intricate weld job. Dang. And she comes in to, to just a tour with her rose, with her weld helmet, with her steel toes. And she's got her bag, her backpack. And at the end of the tour, she says, 
this is a sample of my work. I was wondering if I can interview for a job. And I'm like, yes, initiative, skills, <laughs> capabilities, absolutely, honey, let's go interview. And when I took her over to um, meet with a senior welder and say, she want give her some plates to weld, she's interviewing. He was like, do you know how hard I, it took me so-and-so years to do this. And I said, give her the weld plates. Wow. She welded everything right. Like for most of the welders that we hired, it would take them two tries before they could pass the weld test. We were in aerospace, very specific requirements, right? Because the plane can't fall out the sky. So <laughs> it's bad if the welds are bad. <laughs> right. So anyway, we give her every single weld test she passed the first time. Wow. The, the guy who was snubbing her didn't even do it. Right. Wow. And so she was our first welder. But what if I had said she's a woman? She's young because she was 19. Right. She doesn't have this experience. I would have let that talent pass. And that right. young lady is still there welding. She's one of the best that they have. And she can weld anything that you put in front of her. So, yeah, that's my my rub with the whole DI thing It's too narrowly cast. And it, it requires organizations or it lets them off the hook in educating their employees on all of the ways that bias can come into play and hurt our ability to really leverage the talent properly and thrive. Long yeah. story. I think that, number. like, I think I've heard um, Eva Talley say this a lot, who um, is the chair of the SPE Foundation, and she does a lot of, like, really good DEI education. And one of the things she always says is, you know, it's not, it's diversity of thought. And like, if you just like go real high level and just think like diversity of thought like that, I feel like that's exactly what you're saying. Like it just opens it up to like, it's not about, you know, your race, your gender, you know, it's not about those things. It's about like experience or, you know, the their Capability. perspective. Or cap yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, I love, I love highlighting that because I think you're right. I think when you, when it sounds so narrow, people get like the hairs on their back all stand up and it's like, that's not what it means. <laughs> it's not. And, and like, I, I remember someone like, because they work at a company, I remember a hiring manager tell me, oh, we don't want anybody from this company because this is how they think. And I was like, that's broad. Right. <laughs> Every single person there thinks that way. That's actually impressive. And that might be a cult. <laughs> <laughs> That's broad. Um, and, and, I, and, and, and going back to that, um, I am, I do believe that there are people out there that need someone like me, us to challenge that when we see it, you know, like when, when I am, when I was recruiting and I would have somebody that I knew was, you know, I'm giving you three people and you could pick any one of these and they're going to come in here and do exactly what you're needing, probably give you more. And when you pass on them, I'm going to sit in a meeting and I need you all to explain to me, this was the criteria. Tell me where in your eyes, this person failed to meet this core criteria that we agreed to when we started recruiting. And what I will tell you is I remember the, you know, the first time I had to challenge that process, they said, did you see his glasses? And I was like, what? And he said, well, a person with glasses that old can't be a, a CI person because they're not forward thinking. What? And I remember like I, this was my reaction. <laughs> I was looking for Ashton Kutcher and the camera crew to come around and be like, you were being punked. Like I was really waiting for it. Like, are we serious right yeah. now? Um, but I said, um, let me just, maybe he had his contacts. He wears contacts normally. And maybe he uh, tore it and he didn't have another pair. And those were the glasses in the drawer. Or maybe he likes the retro style. Or maybe like, so I started doing that and they were like, okay, okay, that wasn't fair. And I said, okay, so let's get back to the core criteria. Like, let's, this is what we, we're looking for. Talk to me about how he did not qualify or meet those criteria. Well, he does meet everything. Yeah. And so there are people typically like, hopefully like me, advocating 
for that diversity because there's someone in their mind that mm -hmm. has created a narrow view of what acceptability is. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to be brave enough to challenge that. Yeah, I think sometimes people are a little slick or think they're slick and think like, oh, I've, you know, I figured this out about you because of this. And it's like, probably not. <laughs> it's <laughs> right. a nice right. try, but probably not. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So speaking of forward thinking, um, you know, since you have nice forward thinking glasses, um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of talk about uh, AI and how that's going to affect like future workforce. Can you give us some of your thoughts on this? Like what kind of changes are we looking at? Uh, what types of new roles can this create for like the plastics industry? How, how should we be getting ready for the robots to take over? Because I, for one, am tired and I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's a couple of parts to this that as a, um, I would say, a HR leader or responsible for human capital, it is exciting and it scares me at the same time. So one way it's exciting is there are so many tedious activities that AI is going to take off of our hands, that administrative stuff that none of us like. Um, right now, like, I, I, I love Copilot. Like, I'm like, me, co-pilot is, I told my husband, it's my new man, right? <laughs> and um, you just have to accept that we're now in a three people relationship because co-pilot <laughs> helps me, right? <laughs> co-pilot <laughs> helps me. So, but, but seriously though, like my, my team, my, my HR team, they're like always coming to me super excited about how it has made their, what they do a lot easier. So they're like, I'm never doing this again because co-pilot. So that's great. On the other end of that is that as we automate and move toward more automation in our factory, we have to have technicians that can keep mm -hmm. up with it. So our maintenance technicians that used to be able to service it, they need a different skill set, right? Um, the operators that operate it, they need a different skill set. And because the evolution is happening a lot, the, I would say the span of evolution is a lot shorter now. They're mm. not just going to be able to like back in the day, oh, I'm going to learn CAD or I'm going to learn whatever, you know, programming and learn this new programming language. You can learn it and you're going to have to learn something again in about six months. Mm -hmm. right? You mm. can learn how to do that. And then it's going to very rapidly evolve and you're going to have to learn again. And what's ha what's going to happen and I know is going to happen is change fatigue. So mm -hmm. um, the managers um, and supervisors and the people leaders in the organization, number one, they now have, they're already like, I have so many generations in the workforce. Everybody wants something different. I'm tired. I don't have time for this. So they're already expressing like, I'm exhausted. I can't keep up with all these need, different needs and wants, right? And right. then we're throwing in a, like it is a, a fundamental requirement for constant learning evolution, learning and application evolution. And how do I get somebody whose pay is going to stay the same, by the way? Because it's not like every time they learn something new, the companies are going to be shelling out money. Right. Learning something new is going to be a core job requirement. Reskilling yourselves every six to nine months is going to be a core job requirement. So how do we get people that want to do more when we have a new generation that's coming in and saying, you know what, work-life balance is not optional for me. Right. I'm not doing all of that, right? And that's the challenge where... I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm a little bit panicked mm -hmm. on what kind of systems I can put in place for one, micro learning. Um, two, like, you know, because it, it can't feel overwhelming. It can't yeah. feel overwhelming. I have to gradually bring people into that next learning phase and gradually bring them into the learning phase, uh, the application phase without it feeling like my job just changed again, right when I got comfortable with it. And then for the old, the, the, the maintenance technicians or the operators who are like, I just figured this out and now I got to learn something different. They already don't want to come into manufacturing. Right. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, so positive thing is greater efficiency will need fewer people to do it. Um, negative uh, aspect of it is I really have to figure out how to make sure that we can sustainably support the workforce in this rigorous learning cycle that they're now going to be challenged with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, you, you know, uh, kind of going off of that, you, you know, and talking about some of these new people coming into the workforce, complaining about work-life balance, we've seen this, this movement happening in society that, because some people are calling it the me first movement, right? Putting yourself and your own happiness first, um, setting, you know, more, more or setting better boundaries, that kind of thing. Um, can you talk about some of the impacts that you've seen from this, um, both in the workforce and company culture um, and in, in the individuals themselves and their their development? I think that with the, the me first, there's there's a little bit of a, another nuance. It's me first and only me, right? And so, so many people are entering into the workforce and they have no use for collaboration. They have no use for collective goals. It's like, this is what I want. This is what I need. Make sure you're giving that to me or I'm leaving. And the, this is a thing. Because there are more jobs than there are people, they will leave and they will continue to do the thing. And what that does for the individual is one, it hurts their development. It's kind of like the example that I gave earlier. I went in, I had to work with this team. We had to accomplish the goal as a team. And if I wasn't invested enough to resolve that conflict or figure it out, because it was a conflict, right? If I was only like, this is making me feel away. I don't like that I'm being ignored. In order for me to grow, get a promotion, they have to listen to me. I'm opting out and I quit and I go find a new job. If I stay there and I learn how to work and connect with these people through that adversity, through that challenge, I'm better for it, right? I am personally better for it. The organization is better for it. The team is better for it. So you learn a skill when, yes, I do believe there's something very important in making sure you prioritize yourself in your experiences. For example, I tell everyone, when you get a job before you start day one, yes, you want to understand what the organization is expecting of you so that you can perform well, but what are you looking to get for yourself? What skills are you looking to pick up? Because you should be getting them along the way. That makes your career experience more meaningful, right? So that part is definitely necessary. But if you are only concerned with you, if you're only concerned with what you need, you're going to miss critical developmental skills that will enable you to really go far and have great impact in your organization. The other thing is, if you see someone that is having an out, like I can't tell you how many, I would say, peer mentorships that I've done or upward coaching where I had a manager that was acting wonky. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, nobody likes you, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, like, is that the way you want to be remembered? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know, like we, when we have to work, like, like there's a collective gasp when we know we have to work with you. Do you know that? Like, you know, <laughs> like, and, and so sometimes they're like, I don't care. I'm in control. And I'm like, yeah, but when you're not here, we're, we're like, we're going to, if you, if there's something, an obstacle in your path and you're going to trip, nobody's going to say anything. They're going <laughs> to let you trip. I just want you to know that. And if that's not okay with you, you might want to do something different. <laughs> right. <laughs> So um, I, I, I think that's the concern that I have, like with the only me, I'm only concerned about myself. You worry about yourself, that we we are not properly weighting the significance of team impact or collaborative impact on our individual development. And I see a lot of what I call one dimensional or two dimensional um people in organizations that never really fully develop. And then they end up wondering why. And it's mm -hmm. just because you haven't invested enough in, in that team and collaboration and um, dynamic. dynamic. Mm -hmm. We're gonna point people to this episode and be like, see, this is, <laughs> this is what you're missing. <laughs> it's gonna be our most watched episode. You just yeah. tell it. 
Um, yeah. No, that's that's a a hugely important piece, I think. And you know, I think sometimes it's highlighted by the fact that like remote working, blah blah. I'm, I mean, I'm a remote worker. I will never go back to the office. You will have to pull me back there with my cold dead paws. Um, but I can see how you know people who haven't had a chance to experience some of that, you know, that frustration, that opportunity to figure it out or to, you know, e even when you're saying like you come up against an obstacle, if you, if you can't get it with that, you know, that person that everybody's um, hoping trips over stuff, you know, <laughs> learning how to even go around that person or like work the systems another way is a huge part of learning how to navigate a company and can, you know, help develop you in different ways. Like, you know, I, I've always... I've been an advocate for it, but I always say it's just because I'm nosy and I just like to be like, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> um, which is probably super obnoxious, but nobody's told me no yet. So until that happens, <laughs> that feels like their problem, not mine. Um, but yeah, I had I, a, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I had a, yeah. a manager um, that was so concerned about his own reputation that there was a, a member of his team that was flailing, right? And instead of him like meeting with that team member and saying, hey, what's going on? You know, how, like, why, do, why are you, why do you think you're having this experience? Is there anything that I can do? I know that's gotta be incredibly, cause it's, it was very public, right? It's gotta mm -hmm. be incredibly embarrassing for you, right? Let's, let's see what we can do to, to see if we can course correct. Instead of that, the conversation that he had is, you embarrassed me. You made me look bad. Oh. Right? And I was just like, <gasps> <laughs> oh, clutching all of my invisible pearls because <laughs> in that moment, you were so concerned about your personal reputation that right. you missed that your team member was having a horrible experience. You missed what it was doing to their confidence level. You missed what it was doing to their psyche. You missed like, if this person can't get past this, they may think that they're not equipped to do the job and walk away. And mm -hmm. that isn't, it's just like, everybody has a project that they sucked on at some point. Like <laughs> I, I have, I was like, yeah. ooh, that was, that was horrible. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. We don't do that again. Okay. <laughs> that would be a moment for you to share. Like, I remember I had a project where it was just awful and this is what I did to get through it. But if you're so me, 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 you'll miss an opportunity to encourage the heart of the, of your team. And, and that is tragic. It's always tragic when I see that. And I always like, I want to put boxing gloves on, like, <laughs> don't do that to people. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So Latia, you um we we did some digging on you and uh we saw one of your former colleagues um described you as their go-to resource to make things happen. That's a that's a direct quote. Um, you know, and it actually came up. I almost wanted to jump to this question at the at the very beginning when you talked about, oh, you know, I, I wanted to help HR do this and do that. But um, you know, many times, and you've worked for a lot of really big corporations, right? And many times we know at these bigger companies, progress can be slow. Um, what do you think enables you to so impactfully make proactive changes um, in these types of environments? Everything that I do, I connect to the bottom line of the company. I haven't worked for a nonprofit organization before. The companies that I've worked for, it's about dollars and cents. It's about metrics. It's about like if there's a business strategy and you can't link your ask or your initiative to that strategy, nobody's listening to you. Mm -hmm. Right. But if I can really tangibly link what I'm asking you to do, or if I can tangibly link the issue that we're having to, hey, this is getting in the way of us meeting this target, or this is getting, this is, you know, stealing this much from our bottom line. And some of the language that I would use would be like, do you know how many of the, how much I would have to get in sales to make up for the loss that we're incurring here because this process isn't working properly? And then they would be like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'd have to sell another $10 million to make up for this. And I'm going to tell you, there isn't an executive that wouldn't, everything is a screeching halt. Okay, tell me more, right? <laughs> it's like, you have to talk 
if you're in business, you got to learn business economics. You got to be able to talk money because they're not, it's not a country club. They're not there for situational status. They're there for a business purpose, which is typically profit and a good, strong profit. So if you're trying to figure out why nobody's listening to me, you haven't figured out how to connect it to the money and mm -hmm. or the strategy, right? Because it's either one or two, and either something is going to enable the strategy or it's going to be an inhibitor, either it's going to make the company money or it's going to deteriorate the, something from the bottom line. And so that's, and, and for me, it's like wherever that problem is, whether it, it's in operations or finance or in you know quality or right now there's a lot of sustainability stuff wherever that that gap is that's where I'm going because I like I like to see profit and I like bonuses bonuses are good <laughs> always good <laughs> I love that um, well Latia this we have hogged up your way more time than you originally uh gave us and we are so appreciative of that we could easily I mean we still had probably like five more questions and we could talk to you for another hour and a half minimum um mm -hmm. <laughs> but we just want to thank you so much for number one not being afraid when we medium aggressively approached you and <laughs> you know and saying yes uh to being on this podcast I think it's been a really um, good perspective for, you know, kind of the other side of the industry that we don't necessarily like take a good look at and then go like, we just don't have enough trained workers. And that's the voice. <laughs> that we do. Um, and, you know, I, I think some of this insight is, is stuff that people miss when they're, they're starting to think about like filling the pipeline and filling their employees. And um, I just appreciate all your insight. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I Sorry, just like when you spoke on the panel, I have like a page and a half of notes here. <laughs> really good information. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to thank you guys for having me. I I um I think what you're doing is really important. Um, hopefully, there the right people will hear it. Hopefully, there will be somebody that's trying to figure something out, and something will be said here to help them. I watched a few of your podcasts, and it seems like that's your way to go. So, um, a lot of good news for people to use. So, thank you guys for. For everything that you're doing to to get the word out. Thank you. Thank you so much.